So again, thank you very much for, for inviting me to be here. My second visit to, to Houston. Um, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic city, it's a fantastic location to think about questions around energy, of course. And as you heard in that introduction, my work generally is more to do with oil and gas for the purposes of a, a demonstration of where we are with the, with the Energy Institute. I suggest that I would, I would take on the question of nuclear energy. So this is like caveat here as I as I um, in, embark upon this particular theme. So the question, how is nuclear power displayed in Austria? Austria, uh, a country that's been in a nuclear free zone since 1978. Um, and I want to start with this man, Bruno Kreisky. Kreisky was the uh, socialist politician. He was Chancellor of Austria between 1970 and 1983. In a speech given in 1988, he made the following, uh, he made that the remark that you have up here. The main insight of my life is that one has to be against nuclear energy. Now this is surprising because Kreisky was one of the major proponents of the Austrian nuclear energy program in the 1970s. He was part of the kind of techno-utopian um, idea in, in, in modernity that's tied up with energy infrastructures of different kinds from the 1950s onwards. Um, he was also the person that put a referendum in place that changed the course of the, of, of, um, changed the course of the way in which energy is imagined in Austria, changed the course, I guess, of, the, of a cultural imaginary there. But this change of heart of his from a speech given late in his life in 1988 has since been highlighted as a, as a victory by the Austrian anti nuclear what I want to do in the, in the paper today is just to begin to investigate this construction and curation of contemporary cultural responses to nuclear energy in Austria. So how is, is nuclear energy imagined today in Austria? Um, what I'm thinking about is how does Austria actually remember the anti-nuclear protests of the 1970s and what's the place of, of, of nuclear power in the Austrian culture imaginary today. And I want to focus, just in the, the short time that I have here, on the way in which nuclear energy is actually displayed, because the paper is really, it's related to this larger project that's mentioned in, in the introduction, actually curating Europe's oil, which I'm really interested in. One could perhaps re reimagine that in an even larger project as curating Europe's energy, and the central questions are these. So what role does energy play in 21st century cultural memory in, in Europe? Um, how is Europe's energy history being archived, narrated and displayed in a whole series of key cultural institutions? Um, and also how, how, how are counter archives being constructed, which is a large, major part of the project as well. And then there's the third question, how does an understanding the processes through which the experience of living under specific energy regimes is being catalogued, controlled and challenged aid us then in imagining new narratives of possible energy futures and potentially also mitigate against particular narratives of new energy futures being, um, being, being imagined or um, indeed being enacted. So what I want to do in, in this paper is focus on two exhibitions in particular. One permanent exhibition in the Technical Museum in Vienna, the other a temporary exhibition which is held in the Regional Museum in, in Graz. And also then to look very briefly towards the end of the site of a nuclear power station built in Austria in the 1970s but never put into service. And this is all being done in the, in the aid of sort of embarking upon the exploration of cultural memory of nuclear uh, energy in Austria today. So why Austria? Apart from the fact that I've been researching and engaging with Austrian culture over a, a long period of time, in terms of energy history, in terms of energy culture, Austria is actually fascinating. In the early 20th century, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as Alston Frank has shown us so persuasively, was the world's third largest producer of, of oil. The dissolution of the empire saw Vienna and present-day Austria lose access to particular oil resources in the empire, but also saw the opening up of oil and gas fields in Austria, um, many of which are actually still in operation today, um, towards the particular Matzen oil field that you can see up there towards the uh, north of, of Vienna. In terms of energy policy post-1945, a major um, <coughs> form of, of, of energy production in, in Austria is, is um, hydropower, and the symbol of the, this large dam building concludes that it's a major symbol of, of the reconstruction of the country after the Second World War. And then, of course, there's nuclear power as well, which was precisely on the agenda in Austria in the, from the 1950s onwards. It saw, that agenda saw one nuclear power station, as suggested, completed, 
two others in planning, but the nu Austria's nuclear agenda came to a very abrupt end in 1978. Um, Austria was the site of a historic referendum in that year when the Austrians voted by the narrowest of majorities, 50.47% against, um, voted by the narrowest of majorities to um, against operationalizing the nuclear power station in Zendorf. And this led to the country then becoming a nuclear free zone. So following this referendum, the so-called um, Atomspeer Gesetz was, was passed in, in December 1978, which basically forbade the use of nuclear fission in the production of energy in Austria. At the same time, which continues the, the, the question of why Austria, Austria, of course, um, is in an interesting geopolitical situation. It's uh, Vienna, the capital of a neutral state throughout the Cold War and the after, is the location and the headquarters both of the International Atomic Energy Agency and, of course, of, of, of OPEC. So Austria becomes a really central place to think about um, energy, energy politics of, of, of all kinds of things about energy history. There's certainly been a lot of work done recently on the Austrian role in the development of the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, rethinking the way in which the 1978 referendum might actually be imagined. This has been led from the University of, of uh, Vienna by Oliver Radko as a project of, a, of rewriting the history of the Cold War, as a project of complicating Cold War narratives, as a project that begins to uncover and think about what Gabriel Hecht, which is writing about France, taught in terms of technopolitics and nuclear energy as part of a more general energy history. And it's, it's a project that also begins to ask questions of what it means to declare a particular territory a nuclear free zone. So from the outset, we need to qualify the idea of Austria as being nuclear free. There is still a, a nuclear research laboratory in, in Vienna. Um, there were two previously operational nuclear reactors in Austrian research reactors in Austria, that was talking about, and, and in Graz. Um, and meanwhile, Austria's nuclear geography shows it surrounded, this is the immediate nuclear geography, this shows it surrounded by reactors in neighboring countries. Now, obviously since Fukushima, the German reactors are being, are being decommissioned, but um, the, the reactors in the Czech Republic, the, the reactors in Slovakia, and also in, in Slovenia remain in operation. Um, and also, and this is, I get under debate at the moment, but at least until recently, a certain amount of Austrian energy is sourced from nuclear power. So if you begin to drill down into figures, you find out that around about 6% of Austrian imports is that of, of electricity are actually um, attributed, can be attributed to uh, nuclear generation. Okay. All of that means that nuclear energy re re remains something which is under debate in Austria. There's been public debate on the role of nuclear power on a number of times since the 1978 um, referendum. Obviously, quickly following the 1978 referendum, we have Three Mile Island, but then we have other landmark events that, that rekindle this, this debate um, about nuclear energy. The anniversaries of Seven Dawn itself, the 5th, the 10th, the 20th, and the 30th anniversaries, also, of course, around Chernobyl, around Fukushima, also during the Balkan War, um, where there was a threat to Austrian security, particularly in terms of the nuclear reactor you can see there in Slovenia, and increasingly and constantly through the questions about what it might mean to um, build a new reactor around Timely in, in the Czech Republic is another area of um, contestation. Notwithstanding that, in 1997, the Austrian Parliament voted unanimously to maintain the country's anti-nuclear policy, and at this stage it is becoming part of the natural, natural cultural mythology. This, this is a country which is, which is anti-nuclear, and that's then uh, led, to, led on to a, a set of controversies very recently around uh, the point around David Cameron's um, securing of EU subventions to build a new reactor in Hinkley Point and Austrians linked to Austria's desire to challenge that uh, use of, of EU subventions. Um, and that's linked also to other uh, policies by FIMA, including trying to make Austria a nuclear free zone in terms of imports as well as in terms of production. So all of that is to say why Austria. It's a background to thinking about what it means to exhibit nuclear, nuclear energy in Austria today, what it means to make public debates about, about nuclear energy, to think of here about um, Latour's ideas on, on um, the use of the exhibition as a form. 
What I want to do then is to turn to Austria's major museum of science and technology, which is the Technical Museum. It was established in Vienna in 1909. It was reopened in the year 2000 after extensive refurbishment. A large part of the first floor of that, of that museum now is devoted to energy, which is not a surprise. It's what we find in, in, in so many of these, of these museums. It's, it has a main narrative about energy divided into three strands, roughly addressing three distinct time periods. We have the, the pre-industrial period, we have the, uh, the time of the, of the power stations, and then we have the period of networks, which is the 20th century. And connected to the latter is a new oil and gas display, which was opened in 2014, which is sponsored by the Austrian oil company, UFFAL. Nuclear energy power is also part of this narrative of the 20th century, this narrative of networks, but the display appears Still is undecided in its engagement with uh, nuclear energy. So this play includes a, a model of the mothballed power station in Svendendorf. It's located off the main energy exhibition. Right? So you come into the main floor, it's the main floor. If you, if you move up through electricity, you find in a corner nuclear energy. Um, alongside the model there, there's also an interactive uh, exhibit where visitors can attempt to pick up and manipulate fuel rods. <laughs> it wasn't working when I was there. Simply wasn't working properly. Neither were the devices working properly upon which anti-nuclear protest songs could be listened to. Um, it has a certain that's not what I wanted. It has a certain shabby chic. This uh, this uh, <laughs> this particular exhibition is a long way then. This is where it's a long way then from these earlier displays of nuclear technology at the World Exhibition in, in Paris in 1937. Uh, the Atomium in, in Brussels constructed in 1958 or the um, large American tuning exhibition, Atoms for Peace, um, that was on show in Vienna in uh, 1955. This is a cue to go in to see that particular exhibition in 1955, tour around Europe in, in that year. Um, this is them installing one of the major images on the landmark, which is in the 1955 Atoms for, for Peace exhibition, held not in the Science Museum, but in one of the major art spaces in the Kinsler House. Now, come back to the Technical Museum and um, we look at this slightly odd exhibition on nuclear power. You can see that the, the overall aesthetic, I used the word shiny chic earlier, that you, 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 we might best describe this as, as, as tired as, in terms of the part of the display. There's a visual narrative here, in other words, of obsolescence. It's a display whose aesthetic is rooted in the past, it's, it's rooted in the 1970s, it remains rooted in the 1970s. We might argue that the nuclear project here is displayed as an abandoned practice, and this would seem to invite a different kind of display to what we have here that might begin to draw out the reasons behind these abandoned practices, to draw out the scientific debates leading to the defeat of nuclear technology as part of the display itself in order to contextualize this. We don't get that. The, the exhibition could be set out to show the technopolitical dimension, taking up the reasons for the elimination of these practices in Austria at a time in which other country, European countries, France as a prime example, embraced the nuclear future. Here, what we get is simply, in the aesthetics of, dis of the display itself, the technology is already presented as obsolete, as derelict. It's presented in its present form as a folly. Okay? And not as a technology that's left any kind of devastation in its wake. It's not rubble that we have in, in terms of the, the display here, but a ruin, and a ruin that's ordered, that's orderly, and that's fundamentally actually under control. Now, the exhibit appears, in that case, to be a marked contrast, perhaps a dominant nuclear aesthetic result that revolves around ideas of technological sublime. Um, these ideas, of course, centre on the idea of the ruin as well, um, but it's the potential for destruction inherent in the technology itself that figures most strongly in these kinds of um, in, the, in, in these kinds of imaginations. So David, for example, noting his much cited contribution to 1984 diet, special issue on, on nuclear culture, making the claim that the fabulous the textual nature of the nuclear holocaust, and suggesting that the main threat of nuclear technology is actually to the uh, Judeo-Military archive itself. The potential for destruction of the archive, the potential for destruction of all traces of human existence is the basis for a nuclear aesthetic based on repulsion and attraction. It's an aesthetic that's to be found in, in literary theoretical accounts of nuclear encounter, those that are picked up again and again and again in this, in this conversion field of all nuclear culture, Show and others. It's there to a limited extent, I think, as well in the work of Austrian writers, some like Christoph Ramsmark, for example, does take up this kind of this kind of um, aesthetic. And it is there to a limited extent in the Technical Museum. 
So alongside a kind of dominant narrative of positive, of rational abandonment, the destruction of potential nuclear technology does figure in at least two ways. First, in educational tours uh, that focus on the legacy of Fukushima, the model of Tsvendendorf takes on the, man, on the mantle of a kind of warning monument, a manma, a memorial specifically designed to warn to, to admonish. In Austria, as in Germany and other places, Fukushima, of course, gave rise to, to a clear reaction, um, a reaction that's been described in the, in the Austrian press as um, a panic over atomic energy. And, and interestingly, described as that in a part of the press that one might have imagined to, to have a strong anti-nuclear stance in, the, in a publication called Falta, which is very much involved in the 1970s nuclear movement, but, but produces a very different perspective in, at the time of Fukushima. Secondly, perhaps less obviously, just the display also includes a small number of contextualizing documents and visual objects relating to the referendum that presented the intention to bring Svendendorf into operation in 1978, such as this photograph taken as the label informs visitors at a polling station on the day of the Svendendorf referendum. And it's only really with the uh, contextualizing information of the label that's the significance of that photograph within the within this, the technical museum within the exhibition of all energy becomes clear. It requires its label to imbue with meaning, to connect it to narratives of destruction. Other exhibitions engaging with Austria's nuclear history are able to employ similar photographic documentation in a rather more straightforward fashion. So in 2008, we went to the next exhibition I wanted to talk about, an exhibition with the title No Nuclear Power Station in Swindendorf, 30 years on, 30 years, years on. This went on show um, in the UNA in, in Graz to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the referendum. Um, picking up on earlier exhibitions which did something very similar. The exhibition in Graz functioned explicitly to construct Swindendorf as a site of memory, as a site of construction of particular values, values directly opposed to the destruction of potential nuclear power and indeed to the technological system. The exhibition takes as a central point of critique the misplaced technical <coughs> optimism of the pro nuclear lobby, which included industry, in the 1970s industry, major trade unions, and both leading political parties, the Conservative UVP and also the Socialist SPU. Um, against that dominant, uh, or the, I guess that misplaced um, techno optimism, it presents the memories of a subset of the wide coalition of opponents to the nuclear power station in the 1970s, amongst them scientists from different disciplines, concerned scientists. Mothers Against Nuclear War, trade unionists, members of the extreme left, particularly the Maoist faction, the Communist Party, and others that, that uh, picked up the mantle of being anti-nuclear. Now, there are recent questions raised about some of the opponents and their, their politics. This might explain some of the, uh, the culture's hesitation in aligning itself very clearly now with the, the, uh, the anti-nuclear lobby. There are connections between some of these earlier organizations and um, extreme right-wing um, organizations which um, serve to complicate perhaps the picture of protest and the picture of being anti nuclear as part of a particular sense of a national cultural mythology. That kind of difference is flattened out in the construction of Sentendorf Society of Memory to which the exhibition contributes. It's seen as Sentendorf in the real place that constructs an Austrian collective memory around the idea of environmental consciousness. It's linked to other now mythical sites of environmental protest in Austria, such as Heimburg, again, as a site where Station was um, was prevented. Building of power station was prevented. The exhibition saw explicitly to place particular protest to, to place the protest that took place in, 19, in the 1970s in the context of 1968 on one hand and new social movements on the other. Social protest itself is, is presented as an important legacy of the nuclear age in Austria. And this is evident from the constellation of photographs that form the core of the exhibition. There are numerous images of marches, of rallies, the markedly DIY aesthetic of which the, the, the photographs that all could also be the, the, uh, the rallies themselves uh, amount to an archive of a particular form of peaceful protest which writes out much of the confrontation that was actually part of the movement and is in direct contrast and presented in direct contrast to, I apologize for the body of this image, to the futurist aesthetic of the power station self-presentation. This is from a color um, postcard which was produced in the 1970s to celebrate the idea of um, producing electricity for the future. So as a site of memory, Svendendorf is imagined uh, in the exhibition as both monument and also a kind of warning monument, the, uh, the idea of a man now, the latter with connotations of warning and admonition. As a monument, it continues to function as a sign of Austria's confidence in the environment, in its environmental credentials, and in its ability to affect grassroots change. Yeah, this is the um, 
This is the lesson that underlines a, a recent film by uh, Robert Canova, 2015, called Macht Energie. Um, it's, it's translated into English as Energized. Um, it's, a, it's a film that takes issue of the energy industry, that warns against plans to open up Austria to fracking, that opens up the possibility of energy alternatives for the 21st century, that seek to leave behind the model of the network, to abandon the logic of, of the grid, to recreate the magic precisely in the ways that, that we were hearing earlier, particularly from, from Gretchen and, and then also from Jenny. As a, as a, as a man, on the other hand, it's increasingly being invoked in the 30 years after the exhibition as a, as a spectre, it's hinted of itself as a spectre of the future that might have been and might still be should the idea of a nuclear renaissance we'll hear about um, in Catherine's paper game for a retraction. And the book to accompany the exhibition offers interesting observations on the idea of nuclear, uh, of nuclear renaissance and on its putative supporters. So a trade union activist quoted in the, in the book to, to um, accompany the exhibition, the Lash, argues not openly, but clad in the mantle of the Greens, or of protecting the climate, or of securing peace, that our voice is lobbying for nuclear energy. Um, and what we get here are images relating to the fear of uh, destruction, less prevalent in the exhibition, although we do see some of them um, here in this photograph from, from a theatre group um, burning a nuclear power station here in 1978 with the iconography of some of the original posters that you can see up there as well. In the textual contributions to the Dog Power Station, this is becoming very much my last point here, um, the textual co contributions do invoke Spendin Dog as a, as a ruin in its material presence. And um, Lurch, for example, strives as a virginal nuclear ruin, a concrete giant and a haunted house of obsolete technology. The site itself, as an abandoned space, is now being repurposed. It continues to exert fascination. Mothballed since 1978, it was bought in 2006 by the Austrian uh, energy company EVN e e e as a training facility for those learning how to operate and more recently then learning how to dismantle a reactor. Symbolically, EVN installed solar panels on the roof and it now generates solar energy. It's also the site of a research facility into photovoltaics. It currently markets itself, you can see this, as a unique location for film, television and photography. Um, and what we see there is a spectacularization of the site and a spectacularization of the site that I think, this is my final point, opens up a certain sense of a disruption of the dominant narrative of being anti-nuclear. We can see that in this image, which is an artwork by, by a Swiss artist, Jules Spinach, um, which sent, where he sent a computer-driven camera into the part of the reactor where the fuel rods were thrown in the gods. So the camera goes into the, into the fuel rods and captures 289 images here, which are presented in, in the walls part of an exhibition on non-nuclear sites, or sites of non-nuclear events, I think one should see. The way in which sex, this, this site is taken up, the way in which it's presented, this is, this is an image which won a prize for, from Greenpeace. Um, seems to suggest that it underlines ideas of the importance of being anti-nuclear, of the Austrian cultural memory of being anti-nuclear. And yet this site is not merely a museum piece, it's not merely testament to an obsolete or rapidly becoming obsolete form of technology. It also remains, I think, a site of potential, however unlikely in the current moment. And this is clear, this is my last slide, from a close reading of the facts as presented by EVN on its, on its website here. Yet the same type of reactor in Kunstbüttel, Germany, which commenced operation in 1977, has generated about 130,000 gigawatts hours of electricity. Um, that's more than double the current total electric power generated annually in Austria, represents a total value of approximately 9.1 billion euros. So, what kind of nuclear energy a photovoltaic plant was put in operation in the roof of the outer portions of the plant in 2009? It provides an average of 180,000 kilowatts of electrical energy annually. We've begun to, re to read those figures. We begin to read the potential, the missed potential, which is which is tied up in the first set of figures, and uh, and a set of, and a, a sense of the as yet unproven um, as yet unproven potential of, of, of solar energy. One begins to see that there's still a space open here for debate. I think in a country that prides itself on being anti-nuclear, and yet in the 1978 exhibition only. Um, only sealed that being against <laughs> nuclear power by 0.47%. Uh,